morning, church. Today's scripture is going to be from Genesis 42, 1 through 21. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. The ten of Joseph's sons went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to the ground. As soon as Jacob saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our, where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servant has come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the son of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them in all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in the prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This this they proceeded to do. Wow. I tell you what, she read that very well. <laughs> Sophia, I'm, I'm extremely impressed. The Lord bless through the music. And let's pray that the Lord will bless through the word. Father in heaven, we thank you that you speak to us through the word. Now, Lord... May we listen to what you have to say as we look at the challenges Joseph faced in meeting his brothers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't know if you remember this week, but there was a protest that was upon the news in New York City where a man who has been in prison for almost 40 years, 39 years, is soon to be released for the brutal murder that took place um, on a 16-year-old young lady. Now, what I found fascinating about this story was what the people were afraid of. It wasn't that he was a violent man. It wasn't that they felt that he had paid his duty. But the words came down to the 87-year-old mother, which stated this, I don't think he's sorry. He has never accepted responsibility for it, so how can he be sorry? And so the people in that society were asking the question, is he safe to bring back into the community? It's kind of remarkable about Joseph's story because he he faced the same issue. He stood there in the court. His brothers come marching in, and they bow down. Now, you think about this. The last time he saw his brothers, they showed signs of jealousy. Here comes the brat. 
Here comes the one with the purple coat. Here comes the one. Oh, why does Father like him so much? That's what he remembers. He, they came, in, they were in stable. And the fact is that they saw Joseph, they became irate and threw him into a pit. That's what Joseph remembered. He remembers of how cruel they were. That's what he remembers. But if you remember right, last week or the last time I preached, we talked about how Joseph had a change of heart. Do you remember that story? For those that don't, go to chapter 41, and it's just something that seems insignificant in the verse where it says, Joseph named his firstborn what? What did he name his firstborn son? Everybody together? Do you remember what Manasseh meant? That God has taken my pain away. It says toil. But when you take a look at the original language and you look at that word, God has removed my pain. But now we see that Joseph is acting kind of revengeful. And we have to ask ourselves, what is he thinking through this process? What is going on in his mind? You see, he had to ask the same question because he knew that famine had gone all the way out to Canaan. He knew that his family was going to starve unless they had a supply of food. He had to bring them to Egypt in order to take care of them. But the question he has in his mind is the same question that the citizens in New York had about this convicted killer. Are they safe to bring to Egypt. Did you hear what I said? Do you know what that's called? Investigative judgment. Did you hear what I said? Are they safe to bring into the land? Have they... Uh, Joseph forgave them, by the way. Joseph forgave them, and God had forgiven them. But the last thing that he remembers was their cruel treatment. Now, I find that fascinating of how a person goes through that. It's one thing to forgive somebody when you're in a different place. It's one thing to forgive somebody who has wronged you when they're in a different land and you're in a, in a separate land or a different country. But it's another to face that forgiveness face to face. Would you agree with that? And so, it's hard to forgive. Now remember, what we also talked about last week is that forgiving and trust are two different things. Only one amen on that one. Let me try that one again. Forgiving somebody and trusting them are two different things. Now, I was at Southern College... And, uh, you know, coming from uh, Arizona, from Alaska, you know, Alaskans, I don't know if you knew this, but Alaskans do not have umbrellas. Did you know that? Umbrellas were for girls. <laughs> Real Alaskans didn't use umbrellas. So when I came to Southern College and I saw all these guys with umbrellas, I thought, oh, maybe. But you know, your rain in the South is different from the rain in the North. In the North, it rains. But in the South, it rains. It comes down in floods. Am I right? Well, even here in Florida, you could get wet before you even step outside. Now, here is another uh, difference that I just thought I'd throw at you. Here, you can be in Alaska, you get rain, you get cold. But here, you get rain, it's like taking a shower. Rain comes down, it's not. Well, anyway, I broke down, I know it, I couldn't believe I did this, I bought an umbrella. And I would walk with an umbrella, made sure it was bright red. But I'd walk with this umbrella down the back parts of Southern, and I'd sit in the class, and there was this one guy who said, hey, Quentin, can I use your umbrella? I said, yeah, no problem. Well, so he uses it, comes back, puts it down, and in the process of putting it down, he breaks it. 
Now, what would you do if you broke somebody's umbrella? Now, he didn't. All of a sudden, he said, oh, I'm sorry, man. I said, well, what am I going to do? He said, I don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> I said, don't you feel in your heart that you ought to buy me another one? He reaches into his, I'll never forget this. He reaches into his pants and pulls out and said, I don't have any money to buy you anything. I said, why, you? Or vice presidents here, I can't say any more. <laughs> I was so upset, and I had to go buy another one. Do you think I allowed him to use it again? You see, who said yes? <laughs> who said, Fred, did you say yes? Oh, Joey said yes. All right. No. But see, that's the difference. I forgave him, but that didn't mean I trusted him. Are you with me? And, and so we come to the point where Joseph's family, his brothers are all right in front of him. He is looking at their backs. And we, we see that in chapter 41, he forgave his brothers. So if he forgave his brothers, he comes to another challenge. The first challenge is that after 15 years, he now sees them. How is he going to behave? The second challenge is his memory. Do you remember the pain was taken away? But his remember, his memory was not. I know I, I came across this great illustration. I don't know if you know Larry Lichtenwalter. He's got this book called Out of the Pit. But inside of it, he has an excerpt from a Corey Tin Boone. It's from Tramp, Tramp for the, A Tramp for the Lord. Have you ever heard that book before? Has anybody ever read that book? Corey Tin Boone was in a prison camp, in a Nazi prison camp. She was a political prisoner because she, held, she hid Jews in their cock, or clock shop. And so she was put into prison... And uh, in the process of being in a concentration camp, her sister died at the hands of a guard who was mean. And this is what she says. She, she decides to take the forgiveness route, but I, I thought I'd read this to you. Corey Ten Boom spoke in a church in the Munich on how God forgives freely, completely, it was an incredible message the people in defeat in Germany needed to hear. A sea of solemn faces stared back at her, not quite daring to believe that God was so merciful, so gracious, so compassionate. Then she spotted him, working his way to, towards her through the crowd. One moment, she sees the overcoat, the brown hat he was carrying. The next, a blue uniform and a visor cap with his skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man, her sister Betsy, frail from head to all the way down her body, ribs were sharp beneath the parchment skin. The man approaching her had been one of the most cruel guards at the Nazi concentration camp where Betsy had died. Now, he stood in front of her, hands thrust out. A fine message, Frau Lin. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. Corey's face Corey was face to face again with one of her captors, and her blood seemed to freeze. She had spoken so guiltily of, of forgiveness and grace and compassion, but suddenly she was confronted. She, she confronted the reality that although she could talk of forgiveness day and night, she herself had to forgive. Not in the abstract, 
Not some person whose image had blurred with time, but a real person who had hurt her deeply. Her arm was like lead, and she couldn't lift it to take his, his greeting. She stood there, one whose sins had again and again been forgiven, unable to forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It was the most difficult moment in her life. Coldness clutched her heart. Jesus, help me. She silently prayed. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feelings. She picked up her hand, put it in that guard's hand. And in the rest of the book, it says that all of a sudden, the grace of God flooded her whole body. And for the first time, she was able not just to forgive at a distance, to forgive from the heart. The warmth overtook her, and she took that man's hands, and there were tears flowing between the two of them, because not only did she come to a conversion, but that guard came to the Lord. You see, now Joseph is looking at these backs. He, too, is having a Corey Ten Boon experience. He, too, is looking at the very ones who just about killed him, and in a sense, they did when they sold him into slavery. But you have to remember, God gave him a miracle that day. Spirit of prophecy is clear. When God saw him, it wasn't as though that he saw them. He saw God's hand at work. You see, every soul that comes to the foot of the cross, God's hand is at work. Every soul that has changed, God's hand is at work. For every person that surrenders their life to Jesus, God's hands are at work. And Joseph saw God's hands at work. Now he has to ask the question, are they safe to bring into the kingdom of Egypt? And you know what? Angels today gather around and they wonder, are these people safe to come into the kingdom? They saw what Lucifer did. They saw what sin has done. And here's the beautiful picture of the story of Joseph. Are you ready for this? God is making you ready for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Oh, where was that? I don't know about you, but that's exciting. God is making you ready for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. You can't do it, but God can. All those cruel tendencies, all those jealousy, jealous tendencies that are burning in your heart, God can defrag the mind. So his second challenge was his memory. What I find is his treatment. Because if this is like an investigative judgment, why does God or Jesus seem so cruel? Have you ever wondered that? Why does he greet his brothers, your spirit? Spies. No, I don't believe you. You're spies. Let's take them and throw them into jail. If you read through the lines, if you take a look at the story, Joseph is doing the same thing his brothers did to him. He's treating them rudely as his brothers had treated him. Joseph is in jail for three years. He puts his brothers in jail for... Three days. A remarkable story. But you have to understand, and you have to see this. Look at verse 24. We didn't read this in the scripture. Let me read verse 22. Chapter 42, verse 22. Are you there? You have to see this. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin? You see, they called themselves honest men. 
Joseph is saying, are you really honest? Where's Benjamin? If you were honest, did, did you do the same thing to Benjamin? But look at what it says. Reuben said, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Did you hear that? We must give an a what for his blood? Is that true? For almost 15 years, they had stifled that memory. And I'm sure that it kept popping up. Am I right? God brings us back around to our failures. Now, I shared this at prayer meeting, but I want to share it with you before we go to the next slide. You know, when I left Alaska when I was 18 years old, I left from Alaska to Arizona. It was in Arizona that I surrendered to Jesus. And I was so excited about my new walk with Christ. Are you excited about your walk with Christ? But I was so excited about it. I thought, wow. And I thought, well, I'm going to go back for Christmas. I get to go home and share the gospel with my family. Guess what happened? When I got back into my crowd, I fell. It was a painful fall. It hurt. And I left after that Christmas break. I said, I'm never going back to Alaska again. And then the next year, guess what? I went back. I met the same faces, the same people, the same situation. I held out for a while. I held out. But the day before I left, I fell. And, and I want to tell you, I was at a certain place. You know, I, this is hard for me because I don't believe that we should glorify the past. Are you with me? It's not important for you to know where I've been. It's not important for you to know because those sins have been washed away at the foot of the cross. And I don't want to glorify what I was like. I want you to know where I'm going today. Amen. But it was something that had, I, I will never forget. I'll never forget this. Because I, that last time that I went, I was with my friends. I was so good. I was resisting temptation. We were, they went to this party and I was, oh, you know, come on, Quentin, you can go. And I was doing so well. And this one guy named Hans was... Uh, uh, hands was talking to me. He was giving me the hardest time about my religion, about my, my being a Seventh-day Adventist, about, what do you call it, being a, a rabbit because you've changed the way you eat. What do you do, eat rabbit food now? You know, all of this stuff. And that last day, I folded. And I'll never forget the look on his face. And this is what he said. You don't really have anything, do you? You know what? I was actually thinking that you were serious about your belief. And I, I was thinking about going to church with you. I said, but you're like all the rest. Did I hear that? That was an ouch. That's a tail between the legs, get on the plane, and don't ever come back again. And then I can remember a sermon that uh, C.D. Brooks, I love that preacher. C.D. Brooks, and this resonated with me. God doesn't need any cowards in his army. God needs people who can stand. Mariah? But I wasn't able to stand. I said, I can't do this. And once again, God said, now I can use you. I was able to go back again. And when I buried my father in Alaska, I remember my sister said, the first, the last will be first. I never once was attempted again. I figure that it's better to be who I am, and that's in a relationship with Jesus. That's where the power comes. You see, Joseph's 
brothers were going through the same thing that I went through. We blew it. We failed. Listen, Joseph's God is holding us accountable for, for what we did to our brother. And, and listen to this. We did the Corey Tin Boom. Joseph's story. Look at this. Patriarchs and prophets, three days in the Egyptian prison were days of happiness. They were days of excitement. Now, what does it say? There were days of what? Bitter sorrow as the brothers reflected upon their past sins. You see, God wants us to allow Him to go into our closets so that He can wash our sins away. The fact is that the brothers had changed. The patriarchs and prophets says that their character was changed. Amen. But this needed to be taken care of. And so God put them in jail so that they could focus upon what they really needed. And that was a savior. The investigative judgment is all about getting God's people ready for the kingdom. See, maybe some of you have this burden on your mind. Maybe some of you are experiencing the challenge of how could God forgive me? Have you ever had those thoughts? How can God forgive me for what I have done? And yet the other part is, is that God has already forgiven you. The question is, have you forgiven yourself? You see, a part of the investigative judgment that takes place with God's people who are alive is for you to accept the blood of Jesus and let it cleanse your life. Not only to let it cleanse your life, but to believe that the blood has cleansed you. You see, all the way through the rest of the story of Joseph, even when their father died, they didn't really believe that Joseph forgave them. Do you know that God has forgiven you? Do you realize that God wants you to have joy in the journey? You see, once we realize that our past has been bought with a price, that our lives have been bought with a price, and that Jesus comes into the house and he begins sweeping it up, he takes your guilt away. I don't know about you. There are too many people that are asking themselves the question, how can God forgive me? The investigative judgment is all about you believing that God forgave you. Did you hear what I said? The investigative judgment is all about you believing that God has forgiven you. What a challenge. So his brothers are in jail. Their characters have changed. And here's something, here's a promise for you. God can change your character too. That, why would that sound so weak? God can change your character. All you have to do is say, God, Lord, I give you permission to begin changing my life. And guess what he does? He shows up with the vacuum cleaner, he shows up with the broom, and he starts knocking on your door. Are you going to let him in? You see, the story of Joseph is end time. It's what God's people will have to go through before we see Jesus come in the clouds of glory. It's all about God making right what was in your li- taking place in your life. You see, for... All of this time, God has been working, defragging the memories of those who are asleep in Jesus. Because when they come out of the graves in the twinkling of an eye, their mind is going to be pure. They're not going to have that bend to do that which is wrong anymore. And yet God is working with us now while there's still time for us to accept Him. And I understand some people go through pain, things that have happened to them in in their lives. And I want to give you freedom today in Jesus Christ that he can take that pain away. Not only take that pain away, he can change your life. I 
I want to end with God's amazing grace. Because take a look at this. I want to go back to verse 21. There's a reason why I don't put verses upon the screen because I want you to be in the Word. I want you to be able to look at what the Word has to say for itself. And so, do you bring, did you bring your Bibles? Here it is, 42, chapter 20, or verse 21. And they said one another, Surely we are being punished because of our, because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. You know, there's always going to be somebody in the crowd that's going to point out what you've done wrong. Somebody's always going to tell you what you're doing wrong. People already know what they've done wrong. People know in their heart what they've done. But here's Reuben. And then he said, they did not realize, verse 23, they did not realize that Joseph could understand them. Did you know that Jesus understands you? Did you know that Jesus understands you? Do you know that Jesus understands you? And here's what Jesus does. Here it says, that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. Verse 24, he turned away from them and began to, what does the Bible say? What does it say? Everybody together. God of heaven weeps over you. That the angels of heaven weep at the, at the frailty of humanity. That the weakness of humanity... We are prone to do the wrong thing. And God has pity upon those who have little strength to do the right thing. What a beautiful picture. As God stands with God, Jesus stands with the Father, and they weep over humanity, and they don't give up on humanity. Did you hear that? They're not giving up on you. Every one of us, every one of us is experiencing the master physician because he has to go deep. He just can't take care of the surface. He doesn't take care of the surface. He's got to go to the heart. Third grade, I was climbing a tree and I fell out of it and I broke my arm. I was rushed to the hospital. My father did not trust the doctors in my little community and sent me to Colorado, Denver, Colorado, where I was in traction for two weeks, busted elbow. After that, the doctor says, I think it's going to heal. I went back. That was in third grade. Fourth grade, I tried to impress a girl. I got on the monkey bar. <laughs> It had ice on it. So when I went to that next monkey bar, I slipped, tried to catch myself with the arm, and broke it again. This time I went to the doctor that my, my doctors that my father feared. And, and I'll, well, here's what they said. Oh, that looks different. Hmm. Yeah, you'll be okay. Now, how, would you feel confident with that? Oh, that looks weird. Uh, you'll be okay. I wasn't okay. This bone stopped growing. My arm took an angle because this bone kept growing. And so my arm had an angle. It was a weird angle. And the doctor said, I'm going to send you to a, a real doctor. Thanks. I wish I would have known that prior. So my dad said, uh, I went down to Oregon, Portland, Oregon, Sandy area. There was a specialist. 
He says, I can fix that. And so I went down for a surgery, and you know what he did? Is he cut a hole right here in my arm, opened it up. He cut my bone in half. He took out a V. Then he put my arm back together so it was straight. And he put a screw and some bailing wire in there. But he had to cut out that bone in order to make it match. Why am I telling you this? Because the master surgeon needs to go deep into your heart. There are some things that are bent that he needs to fix. And the only way that he can really fix is if you allow him to cut into your heart, cut into your body, cut into your mind, and take the growth out that needs to go. Because then when you come back out, you will have the scar, but your arms will be straight. Your heart will be straight. Your life will be straight, even though you still feel the screws and bailing wire in your arm. Joseph was a type of Christ. Joseph saw God's hands working. I submit to you today that you are going to be the Joseph's before Jesus comes. You are going to have grappled with and allowed the Lord to win in your heart. You're going to allow Jesus, because I tell you what, Tim, I want to see Jesus come. I want to look up and see his face and say, this is the God that I've waited for. Then all that took place in my life will be insignificant because my life will be in Jesus Christ. His words will come to life in my heart and in my soul. His words are going to change us because what Jesus says, Jesus does. If he says that you're free, you are free. What you need to do is believe that you're free. Leave the consequences with the Lord. Maybe there are some today that need to experience those wonderful words of life as the praise team is going to be singing that as they come forward at this time. Maybe there's somebody here that needs to experience the master physician. You know, pastor, there's just some things in my life that I haven't been able to shake. I'm willing now to allow the great physician start his surgery on me. Somebody here can relate to that, and you'd say, you know what, I need that to happen in my life, and you want to stand up, now's the time. Say, I need the great physician to change my life. And you hear his voice say, now's the time. Now's the time to experience salvation. Now's the time to believe his words. Now's the time to allow the words to, to consecrate you, to allow the words to fill you with joy. Now's the time for salvation. Now's the time that we experience the wonderful words of life.